If you dip styrofoam into acetone, rapid bubbling occurs. Air escapes from the foam, leaving you with long chains of polystyrene mixed with acetone. This new goop is quite sticky and immensely flammable. It's a pyro material, a styrofoam pyro material, a styro pyro. I recently got some chemicals in the mail and they came in the styrofoam box to keep them cold during transport. I know it's styrofoam due to the PS and number six on the bottom. This says that it's polystyrene, a polymer of styrene. Styrene is one of those compounds that's well known, but not at the same time. It's used in most plastic and rubber. Styrofoam is the most produced, but it's also used in acryl nitrile butadiene styrene. Those who are 3D printing enthusiasts know this as ABS plastic. In the lab, styrene can be synthesized a few ways. The most common, which is dehydrogenation of ethyl benzene. This becomes pointless when we take a look back at polystyrene. The reason why is it's a polymer. All we need to do if we want styrene is to completely depolymerize the polystyrene, which is easier said than done. First things first, polystyrene is generally found in its expanded form, whipped full of air, making it super light and giving it nice insulative properties. But this is not practical for filling up a reactor. By using a solvent such as acetone or a similar hydrocarbon, one can dissolve polystyrene into a goop, releasing all the trapped air. If you are a kid that grew up loving fire, you know this makes a pseudo napalm, as discussed in the intro. And now you know the reason why it burns so dark and with so much soot. It's because it was burning of an aromatic compound, which normally burn very poorly and very sooty. I took this goop and popped it into the drying oven to force out all the acetone. This ended up getting stuck pretty well. I should have seen that coming. Well, after getting the chunks out, they are quite large still, so I popped them into a blender to make them into a powder. Now with more manageable form, we can start the reaction. The method that I will use today is known as destructive distillation. We can crack the organic compound's bonds with a high enough heat. The polystyrene is then transferred into a flask, preferably one that you don't care much about. Next, a simple distillation setup is put together along with a heating mantle. The reaction flask is ramped up to 450 to 500 degrees Celsius. High temperatures are needed for this reaction to take place. Once hot enough, vapor started coming off the polystyrene. It was having some trouble coming over the distillation adapter, so I wrapped it with aluminum foil to keep more heat in. The reaction occurring is known as homolytic cleavage, where by using heat we can cause free radicals to form, splitting the polymer. These new radicals rebond to form stable compounds. When a styrene is formed due to this temperature, it leaves the system by boiling off, and any radicals continue reacting. The breaking apart of the polymer does not always make styrene. This reaction style, also referred to as destructive distillation, is not a very clean process, evident by the dirty distillate, which will be need to be cleaned up. After a little bit, it works its way down the condenser and rolls into the collection flask. It started off nice and clear, but over the course of the reaction, it turned yellow. Shortly after the change in color, no more product came over. I could have forced the temperatures up to get more product over, but the chemicals coming over at these high temperatures are most likely large fragment compounds from the reaction, not the styrene we want. I let the distillation setup cool before the next step. During that time, the crude product turned from a yellow color to a pink color. At this point, I took a small sample to compare later. The crude product is then transferred to a separatory funnel and then washed with water a few times to remove any water-soluble impurities that may have formed. Next, the crude is transferred to another flask. And another distillation setup is created. This time, we will include a condenser between the distillation adapter and the crude flask. This will act as a fractional column allowing larger temperature control. The reason why this is important is because it will allow cleaner product. 
anything that has a higher boiling point will condense and roll back down into the flask. This normally happens with a normal setup, but to a lesser extent, leading to more impurities coming over. The mantle temperature was ramped up slowly. Material started working its way up the column. Material started coming over below the temperature that which styrene comes over, but rose quickly. The flask was switched out and the product was then collected. We collect anything that comes over to the collection flask at around 145 degrees Celsius. Anything below this temperature will not be our styrene, and anything after this temperature range will also not be our styrene. You may have noticed I had to wrap the column with some aluminum foil. This was because it was condensing and was not making it over. The foil helps to keep in heat and allow the temperature of the column to increase till we get our boiling range that we want. After about an hour, no more styrene came over and I took off the flask. And I transferred a small amount to analyze later. With our clean product now in hand, let's test it. I prepared two gas chromatography mass spectroscopy vials made up of the initial crude and the final product, using dichloromethane as the carrier solvent. It would be cool to see what the leftover gunk is, but due to the high boiling temp, my GC mass spec cannot handle it. It only goes up to 280 degrees Celsius. The samples were loaded into the machine and I ran a quick 20 minute sample per run. While that was going, I took a bit of the dark oil left over and an FTIR analysis. That stands for Fortier Transfer Infrared Spectroscopy. A few points of interest are the carbon double bond carbon with a hydrogen on it, a carbon single bond carbon with a hydrogen on it, which appear in the 3100 range. Another interesting point is around 1500. This is an aromatic peak, aka our benzene. Now with that all done, we can go back to the GC. And it's all done, so let's take a look at the data. Looking at the crude graph, we see a lot of other products besides the one at styrene, which is to be expected. The destructive distillation is a quite messy process, and this serves as evidence for that. All the products that were collected are to be expected. Toluene was a common one, consisting of a benzene ring and a methyl group. Ethylbenzene is also present, which makes sense as well due to how polystyrene breaks up. Of course, we have styrene present. But an interesting thing is that all the peaks down the spectra are a bunch of benzene rings that are bonded together. Now let's compare the final after distillation. Instantly we notice that none of the products that we saw down the spectra are there, which makes sense because we are only collecting products at 145 degrees Celsius. Disappointingly, there's still a lot of junk left over in the collection of the final distillate. The reason why is because of my setup. I should have packed the fractional column with copper, wool, or such packing material to increase the effectiveness of it, or use a real fractional column. If I was to do this over again, I would make sure to use either one of those. For cleanup, I used acetone to rinse out each flask to try to get as much waste out. Next, I place the glassware into a base bath and soak them for a few days. Taking them out, we'll have nice clean glassware ready for the next project. This was quite a fun project and it was cool to see the destructive distillates that were produced. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed.